hello to the people here at the Institute and uh, to everyone who joined us on online through Zoom. So today we have a okay, we have a new guest on our seminar on philosophy and psychiatry, and this is Sergei Shevchenko, who is currently a visiting scholar at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. So he, as he explained to me before, he has a PhD in philosophy of medicine, but also a master's degree in biology. Um, so his interests are mostly into this kind of problems of epistemic injustice in healthcare, but also social and ethical issues and human enhancement. So he's also a founder of the Observatory for Comparative Bioethics, if I'm right, at the Independent uh, Institute for of Philosophy Association in Paris, France. So not, not Paris, Texas, but Paris, France. Um, today, he will be talking about a very interesting topic on the relation between politics and depression, a very controversial, but very timely topic in the philosophy of psychiatry and philosophy of medicine, but also philosophy of politics. So let's hear him today. And everybody is welcome to ask questions during the discussion after the talk. OK, so it is again. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Janko. I'm really glad uh, to be here. and. Uh, it is a really great opportunity for me to present my uh, current work in progress. I'm thinking about uh, writing an academic paper, rather big academic paper on uh, this topic. So I will be really uh, grateful for your feedback, for your remarks, uh, questions, and uh, of course, uh, criticism. So you can launch one. Uh, so, uh, my current uh, talk is uh, devoted to uh, depression and uh, politics. I'm um, uh, trying to uh, view this problem in the phenomenological uh, angle, from the phenomenological angle. Uh, so I will start with uh, brief acknowledgements. Of course, I'm grateful to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nesic for organizing this uh, seminar. I'm uh, also uh, grateful to Professor Rakic uh, for recommending me to uh, make this uh, presentation of my work in progress on uh, this event. And uh, to Professor Matthew Radcliffe for, from uh, University of York for the great opportunity to share my ideas with him and to discuss and to receive his uh, really kind uh, feedback and kind support. Now, uh, I will try to be uh, not to uh, go out of time. So here you can see a uh, kind of uh, table of uh, contents, uh, contents, what I'm going uh, to speak about uh, today. So I will start with a, a few words about uh, bioethical significance of this problem. And then I will go to uh, four forms of relations, uh, variants of relations between depression and politics. And that is uh, the most broad part of uh, my uh, presentation. I guess it uh, also can contribute to uh, some uh, further research of the topic. Uh, and then uh, I will give uh, some thesis uh, on uh, depression, uh, under political oppression about some features of experience of depressed people under uh, experience in political oppression. And uh, then I will try uh, to make some steps toward disentangling of uh, between clinical uh, depression and political depression or um, political oppression, uh, giving you some kind of uh, sort of experience. So hope you will enjoy. Uh, so uh, starting with brief rephrase from 
uh, biotical angle. Uh, so basically, I'm biotheticist. Uh, my uh, current uh, work mainly is linked uh, with um, ethics of healthcare and uh, ethics of new biotechnologies. Uh, so here is kind of a summary from uh, the paper of uh, Cern Holm, a prominent biotheticist uh, from Great Britain. Uh, who, uh, Speaks addresses uh, the problem of why uh, bioethics uh, is uh, not so popular about uh, in, 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 among the mental health professionals and uh, among even uh, philosophers of psychiatry. So and uh, he uh, underlines uh, three mm, moments. Uh, first one that uh, the uh, social context is mainly ignored in the mainstream uh, bioethics. He calls it methodological individualism. Uh, that uh, the problems um, of lived experience are also uh, not not in the focus uh, main the main focus of uh, bioethics, and uh, that um, autonomy uh, understood as um, uh, individual uh, concept is a is a main is a cornerstone of uh, of regulation, uh, current forms of bioethical regulation, and here is a quote uh, from uh, Frederick Sminiaus, uh, great book uh, Phenomenological Bioethics. Uh, people can hear me well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I guess uh, he was even presenting uh, some kind of uh, these kind of ideas in Belgrade uh, during the co conference on philosophy of uh, medicine in healthcare in 2017. It was uh, also located in Belgrade, and uh, I remember this great event, and I was uh, really happy to visit Belgrade first time in uh, 2017. Uh, so his main point is uh, that we should understand uh, from a phenomenological perspective how the world appears to the uh, person with depression and what does uh, she or he uh, feels, uh, how he feels related to other person or whether uh, she can see any possibilities for together. So I hope uh, that uh, my presentation will be a very shy contribution to uh, addressing these these issues. Uh, so we're going to the kind of uh, basic part, depression and uh, political oppression. Um, these topics uh, are mm -hmm. often considered uh, together uh, sometimes are considered together and they consider to be interconnected because, uh, as you can see, occurs more frequently in uh, non dominant groups. And uh, of course, uh, experience of being depressed and experience of being political oppressed are similar in uh, two senses that uh, I will address more deeply uh, during my uh, presentation. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so my intuition is uh, we can classify uh, the forms of relationships uh, between politics and depression uh, in uh, four groups, there are four types. Uh, the most common is that uh, political oppression can induce uh, clinical depression. And uh, that is a really um, well discussed uh, topic in uh, some kind of critical perspective, in uh, critical philosophy. For example, Anne Svetkovic uh, is the uh, author of um very, very uh, top cited uh, book uh, about uh, depression as a public feeling here uh, you can see uh, the quote uh, from the book 
uh, of course, she links um, the depression about, uh, for example, uh, indigenous people uh, from uh, non-dominant group uh, groups in America uh, with the uh, histories of uh, genocide, slavery, and uh, exclusion. And that is like a historical legacy that works uh, inducing uh, the depression uh, from her point of view. So uh, here is a kind of uh, um, statistics uh, association between uh, inequality and prevalence of uh, anxiety disorders and uh, depression. You, you can see that um, mainly people from healthcare sciences are going to uh, make such, such kind of outcomes that of course, these uh, two phenomena, uh, social phenomena, are linked. I can change the slide. I don't know what. Okay, thank you. And now, ah, oh, it doesn't work now. Okay, I, I just can, uh, I just can use. No, no, no. Uh, so, okay, the the previous one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, now I will uh, speak about uh, political uh, regime that induces uh, depression from Svetkovic's uh, point of view and uh, from point of view of her uh, colleagues. Um, but the, the, the most um, rare um, kind of psychiatric intervention towards the topic was made uh, by Edward Bibring. Uh, he was a psychiatrist uh, in uh, Austro-Hungarian, uh, well, he was born in Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, and then he was a uh, psychiatrist in Austria, but he was forced uh, to flee from um, anti-Semitism in uh, Austria and uh, of course in, uh, from Nazi Germany. And uh, he pointed out that uh, depression stems from the experience of helplessness and powerlessness. I um, kindly ask you to store this in, in your memory because I will uh, go back uh, to this in uh, in a few minutes. Uh, yeah, but here uh, you also can see uh, kind of slogans uh, from uh, feminist uh, agenda, the personnel is political and uh, depressed. It might be political. This is how uh, Anne Svetkovic uh, develops uh, this perspective. <clears throat> and uh, about uh, depression as a public feeling. And this view opposes uh, to also very prominent perspective made by Eva Elouz, a very uh, uh, famous, uh, I guess, uh, public scholar, uh, social researcher, uh, where she writes about uh, self-help culture or uh, therapeutic, therapeutic culture as the uh, basic features of uh, modern culture. And while she says that it is, uh, um, okay, not completely bad uh, feature of contemporary world, but uh, Svetkovic has a more critical uh, view towards this. Uh, but, however, what I would like to, to point out, uh, the politicization of uh, depression is not always like pro-liberal, pro-democratic uh, activity because we have uh, this kind of activity in uh, uh, middle war uh, Austria and Germany. And we see that politicization of depression was also a kind of medicalization of politics, a, a sort of or what is called medical imperialism. You see on the bottom of the slide uh, is a link to, uh, to the famous work of John Dupre. He is a kind of uh, scholar, philosopher of biology and uh, medicine who coined uh, this term, uh, scientific imperialism. And 
it was accompanied by uh, political imperialism in uh, Germany and uh, Austria. Uh, you see that, uh, for example, Aaron Stransky, a far-right uh, psychiatrist, he uh, just uh, believed that uh, psychiatrists uh, should be top leading political experts and uh, they should share uh, what he calls healthy medical imperialism to protect the nation from kind of outside influences from uh, other ethnic groups from other nations and uh, uh, he also adopted racial uh, hygiene even in uh, uh, 1980. Um, and also Henrik Rogge uh, was working of uh, conception of uh, psychopolitics. Uh, I guess it is uh, even more connected with uh, what we can uh, call um, like psychiatrical imperialism. As that uh, the view uh, that uh, uh, scientific understanding, uh, psychological understanding of human mind can resolve uh, any political uh, problems and conflicts. So we, we are going to, to the second and I will try to, to hurry up. Uh, uh, political regimes can also alter the meaning of depression as a diagnosis. And that is very significant topic that I think is under discussed in the uh, literature. Uh, because um, there are different forms of uh, this uh, intervention. Uh, there is medicalization of inequality, and uh, Tvetkovic is uh, struggling against this. Uh, you see that uh, underrepresented groups, uh, historical underrepresented groups experience uh, oppression, but uh, it can be uh, classified as a psychiatric disorder, uh, some kind of uh, schizophrenia, for example, among uh, African Americans in 30 years ago. Uh, depression can be um, a sign of uh, some kind of political or even moral, ethical, social attitudes uh, disapproved by oppressive regime. Uh, for example, we have comparable situation in contemporary Myanmar, where uh, the prevalence of depressions is really low. You can see that it is kind of uh, very few people in Myanmar are depressed. But uh, local uh, psychiatrists tend to interpret uh, the depression as a form of political protest. And that is why people uh, don't want to, to go towards them and share uh, their experience of depression. Or uh, probably doctors uh, just changing their diagnosis uh, in order not to endanger their uh, patients. And um, it is uh, also a good story about uh, Mikhail Zoshenko. He was probably the top uh, satirical writer in the uh, rare Soviet Union. But uh, during the Second World War, he was writing uh, and publishing um, you know, some chapters from his book Before, the, Before Sunrise. And uh, he uh, self-analyzed uh, the episodes of uh, his depression. Uh, these uh, chapters was uh, really uh, praised by academics and they invited uh, him to uh, what is was called Brain Institute. It was a really big and a very well-funded uh, institution, research institution in the Soviet Union. They also had a uh, uh, brain uh, of uh, Vladimir Lenin and they uh, just uh, was researching why was uh, he so genius to make the uh, revolution and uh, probably there are some peculiar features in um, kind of biopsy of uh, his, uh, his brain. Uh, but uh, Zoshenko was uh, exposed to persecution, to political persecution, because uh, authorities uh, regarded his book as the anti-Soviet provocation, anti-Soviet attack during the war. And here is a kind of story that become very popular 
uh, anecdote or a popular joke in uh, Russian-speaking countries, Russian-speaking communities. Uh, Zoshinka came to a uh, psychiatrist and uh, he complained uh, that uh, he experienced uh, the symptoms of depression. And the doctor advised him to read Zoshinko. He writes funny novels, but uh, the patient um, uh, answered with a deep sigh. I also uh, ask you to uh, remember this sigh. Uh, the fact that the deep sigh is a kind of political gesture in oppressive communities. Uh, oh, doctor, I write, uh, I'm the person who writes uh, this uh, novel. Um, and uh, this third uh, form of altering uh, the meaning of diagnosis is uh, uh, that medical records of depression makes uh, officials, repressive, oppressive officials, uh, the way uh, to know what people are thinking about. Here is a situation of uh, Edith uh, Jacobson, um, psychoanalyst uh, from uh, Germany. She was Jew and she was, uh, migrated to the uh, United States, but she was imprisoned for their refuse uh, to share uh, the names and medical records of her clients from communist party, from people with having communist uh, views. So we are going to the third uh, form of relations uh, between political oppression and uh, depression. Uh, oppression can intensify certain elements of depressive experience. So these uh, traits of experience already exist, but when people, a uh, person undergoes uh, to uh, what is called uh, political oppression, she or he uh, experience these traits in more uh, strict, more harsh form. Uh, so, for, for example, uh, people who refused uh, from appropriate treatment um, by, if they are discriminated, uh, this, of, of course, can worsen their well-being and, of course, make uh, specific traits of the experience uh, more vivid for them and for uh, other people. And uh, um, we also can see that uh, in the narratives of depressed people who uh, underwent uh, political oppression, these um experience are reinforcing each other i would not like to delve uh into this topic because it is you know, we can hardly distinguish it from the transformation of the experiences of depression under the political oppression because okay a uh, person experience uh, sorrowness or detachment from any togetherness in in a more uh, vivid manner. Probably this it is not uh, enforcement of uh, some feature, but alteration of uh, of the whole experience. Uh, not much um, kind of uh, healthcare or research. Uh, devoted uh, to to this topic, but there is uh, one. Uh, I'm speaking about the second one. Uh, you see that people in Brazil, in the Chile, and in the United States, they emphasize, emphasize different aspects of loneliness in their depressive uh, narratives, and uh, it is of course political related, not uh, only to political oppression, but uh, to the whole structure of society. But uh, in uh, Brazil and in Chile, some kind of social constraints are viewed uh, as a class barriers. And uh, in, uh, in the US, they are labeled as a racial barriers. So different types of oppression, they form different types of uh, detachment from uh, togetherness. Uh, 
So uh, here I give uh, some brief uh, outcomes of the uh, this part of my presentation. Uh, the rest two parts are much more briefer, <laughs> more brief than, than this one. Uh, so, and Svetkovich, uh, she writes about political depression and uh, uh, she tried to pose our attention towards this one. However, uh, she doesn't delve into clarification, the uh, relation between political depression and clinical depression. Of course, we, we just uh, need to point out uh, that uh, political depression or political oppression, political depression as a result of political oppression can be combined by clinical depression, but uh, not always. It is not the uh, direct uh, kind of causation, but they often co-occur and some kind of causation we, we, we can we can find uh, through the statistical evidence through the uh, different kind of uh, health care evidence. Uh, mm, some uh, people who are into researching uh, political sciences, uh, they mm, uh, try to label the depression as uh, an instrument for making uh, uh, power relations more visible and uh, sensible. And that is why the narratives of people with depression are frequently used as political or legal testimonies. And even uh, they used uh, as this instrument uh, when we are speaking about uh, Balkan countries, uh, post-communist uh, uh, Romania, uh, post post Yugoslavian countries and uh, there are some research uh, about this uh, topic. How, how can I change the, the, the slide? Okay, thank you. Uh, now I will uh, go into some uh, specific features of depression under political oppression, when political depression and clinical depression co-occur. And then I will try to disentangle uh, the phenomenon. Uh, some, uh, here are some politically significant elements of depression experience. It is common for all depressed, not for all, but it is common for depressed people, clinical depressed people, um, frequent uh, among them. And uh, Matthew Radcliffe, who is uh, author of the main book about the topic, uh, Experiences of Depression, he uh, points his attention to all these uh, traits, like uh, the empathy inhibition, and uh, which is linked uh, to it, it detached from sorry for uh, mistake on the slide from uh, detachment from togetherness and uh, decreased novelty seeking. People under depression they are not so ready uh to try something new you are not so often to to run the new experiences and uh of course there are different forms of disturbances of hope uh there are disturbances of existential hope but red leaf um are in is inclined uh to say that majority of people with depression they still have some kind of existential hope just general understanding that something good can occur just like a miracle can occur and uh, the world uh, can somehow uh, go to to the uh, normal state uh, state but uh, there are disturb many disturbances in the sense of hope uh what um uh, do I mean but uh, by all or by all of this uh, that 
the two experiences like uh, impossibility of uh, togetherness and uh, disrupted uh, novelty seeking experiences are perhaps stem from uh, the uh, disrupted realm of possibilities and uh, speaking more uh, uh, precisely about the possibility of a collective event as a result of shared shared efforts efforts of some kind of uh, unity some kind of uh, solidarity entity um this uh, my point is this uh, that this disruption may be deeper than disturbance in the anti anticipation fulfillment uh, dynamic in the realm of possibilities of the experienced world uh, and uh, which uh, this uh, disturbance in this dynamic uh, is uh, mainly uh, described that our positive predictions uh, come true uh, less often than we anticipated uh, and these uh, expectations are associated mainly with cases like uh, some kind of good, uh, pleasant event in your life, like uh, um, pleasant acquaintance, uh, receiving bonus in, on your job and something like this. However, uh, there are expectations of game-changing events. And uh, I'm uh, going to emphasize this kind of disruption, this understanding of uh, event, of collective event. Uh, depressed person, of course, uh, is aware of the possibility of some accidents, uh, collective or global, but uh, depressed person may also um, of course, maintain the existential hope, uh, but um, what is ruined in uh, her or his experience is uh, that uh, it is impossible uh, to influence uh, towards uh, some kind of uh, collective good activities. And here we can uh, recall Bibrin's conception of powerlessness and helplessness as a contribution uh, to uh, experience of depression. And uh, of course, Big Brain, uh, I guess, was an expert uh, by experience in, uh, in the sense of uh, helplessness as a Jew living in the um, Nazi Germany. Um, and here I would like to briefly clarify the sense of the term event from a phenomenological perspective. The main feature of any event is uh, that we cannot anticipate all of the meanings of this uh, event before it occurs. And the event changes uh, temporality, changes many kinds of perspectives. So when a person is hoping towards a collective event, uh, she's hoping that her the structure of her experience will change uh, drastically. Uh, other uh, French uh, philosopher, French phenomenologist uh, Maldini, he coined uh, the specific term to express the human capability to undergo events and our uh, sense of openness towards them because event in uh, narrative theory it is uh, mainly what is understood post hoc we can only describe event uh, not the future event but uh, the event that have already occurred but there is uh, some kind of uh, phenomenological attention towards uh, the event and that is more deep 
according to Maldini, more profound than uh, the common uh, pretension that was uh, coined by Husserl. And uh, uh, the last slide in this section about how can oppressive regimes benefit from a citizen's depression? Uh, there are many forms of uh, these beneficence, but uh, people have uh, low probability in, uh, to take part in some political actions. Uh, these symptoms uh, uh, negatively affect uh, political interest and uh, or firstly affect uh, some physical demanding acts like going uh, into the street and protest against uh, some kind of oppression. When you need physical participation, uh, this kind of, of activity will be oppressed first. Uh, there is another paper uh, sp speaking about uh, that uh, people in depression still may have uh, political interests. They may be inclined uh, to uh, view the new political news and to discuss it, but they uh, don't think that any of their activity can be effective in uh, even be uh, have sense as a contribution, as a symbolic act of contribution towards the changing of uh, what is uh, going on with them. So I'm going uh, towards the um, uh, last part. And for disentangling the clinical and political uh, meanings of depression, I um, I would like to propose a kind of uh, spot experiment. It's a bit long, but I just ask you to also to read uh, this one uh, because it is, uh, first of all, we can imagine a person, uh, a life world of a person, a phenomenological um, experience of a person under political oppression. So the main traits is that uh, she feels uh, her voice is silenced even by people who are not hostile to, uh, to her. Her belief in the possibility of collective event, of some game-changing uh, event, is suppressed. Her novelty-seeking activities are decreased and her empathy uh, is constantly under pressure. She, of course, uh, she's a living being and she has some kind of empathy, but uh, this kind of empathy often endangers her feelings. And at some point, she develops clinical, dep clinical depression. So, uh, firstly, she had been oppressed and then she becomes to be depressed. And a uh, second person, person Bob, um, has a vice versa um, um, destiny. Uh, he was already uh, he already had a political depression, but um, the form of living in his uh, society is rapidly changing and become indistinguishable from what the first person Anna is experiencing. So my question are my questions are um, who uh, would feel the change more profoundly, and what might be the difference in the in these changes in their in the change of uh, their experience? So uh, before given my intuition uh, towards this, I would like to uh, share um, really. Uh, surprisingly deep and bright uh, paper of uh, Dan Degerman. Uh, I hope uh, he's here and I hope I pronounce uh, his uh, name uh, correctly. If not, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, um, he says that there are many different types of silences uh, uh, linked to mood disorders, but he emphasized uh, 
four types, imposed silence, unknowing silence, depressed silence, and peaceful silence. Uh, so uh, we can say that Anna starts with unknowing silence. She feels that she cannot speak because she cannot find the right words because some words can endanger her. While Bob starts with depressed silence. Uh, however, I think that the depressed silence is not the best term uh, for this experience because people under political oppression also can experience this kind of uh, silencing because um, I've conducted uh, around 10 in-depth interviews uh, among people who fled uh, from uh, political oppression and uh, yes it is very frequent uh, uh, line in their narratives that the whole world uh, that any word has lost their meaning. Uh, that words still don't have a, any kind of meaning that cannot be corrupted by oppressive regime. So we're speaking about solidarity and the oppressive regime is speaking about solidarity with the oppression. We are speaking about uh, empathy and uh, oppressive regime is trying to use your empathy uh, to make you more prone uh, to share some autocratic views. And uh, that's it. Any uh, point, even about the peace, about the pacifism, uh, about uh, any normatively mm, a normative uh, concept, normative image of, of the future is corrupted by this uh, regime. So there are no words. So that is why we can't speak. Uh, so it is also um, can be uh, the experience of uh, people under uh, oppression. So, but however, let's stop on the point that Bob starts with this kind of um, silence. So, my intuition that Bob's experience can change more profoundly. Uh, because uh, in some cases, he should uh, learn to hide his feelings and especially hide uh, the depression. I guess Anna uh, have already learned to hide her feelings and then she's going to uh, hide her depression probably even um, uh, not condemning that she has uh, that, that de de depression uh, in such, certain situations uh, he won't have change chance for silence because the picture of oppressive regimes is that uh, they can uh, regard silence as a as a form of protest, as a form of political protest. When everyone is applauding towards the dictator, it is really endangering you not to applaud, not to stand, not to share your excitement to what what, what is going. And uh, uh, there are there could be also some changes in uh, his experience of uh, guilt. I, not I'm not prone to, to delve into this right now. What uh, will occur uh, to Anna? Uh, Anna's experience also undergoes significant changes. They, of course, can be even more deep. That is only my intuition about the world of uh, thought experiment, not, of course, uh, speaking about the real uh, persons, because it is... Uh, we are checking our intuitions, not uh, the social reality, uh, uh, doing this thought experiment. Uh, uh, here, hope for small jo joyful events, not the game-changing events. 
also will be suppressed during the operation because under operation, of course, you can uh, think, okay, I will uh, today something good can occur with me. Okay, my favorite uh, football team will win. My, uh, I don't know, uh, son will uh, have good marks in, in the school and so on. Um, uh, and uh, however, Anna made, might suffer less from imposed silence while uh, because depression uh, suppresses her desire to communicate and sometimes he will have uh, the experience of peaceful silence uh, like uh, little breaks in her struggling however Bob who used to uh, undergo uh, into this peaceful science silence he will not be able uh, to experience this more safely because uh, in any time he will think oh i'm right now in a peaceful science but what if someone will ask me what are your political views towards what is going on today so i will i would like to conclude with another soviet anecdote about the side uh, and silencing. Uh, two strangers are sitting next to each um, other on a bus uh, that is passing by uh, Lubanka Square, where KGB, like uh, security service in the Soviet Union, was located. One of them uh, only sighs heavily, and the other says, Oh, don't even start uh, saying me that. Don't even start complaining. Why are you telling me this? Because the sigh is a good uh, gesture. It is uh, a more profound than uh, the words. And uh, we don't know that sigh uh, breaks silence or it is a form of protesting silence uh, at the moment. So thank you for your attention. Now I'm going to open the floor for discussion. Thank you, Sergei. This was a very wonderful and interesting presentation. Um, so we open discussion and people here or online can ask questions. I hope that that was not too, too frustrating experience uh, that you can't uh, ask anything. Okay, if no one has a question for now, or, okay, do, do we have someone? Dan? Yeah, hey, I, I can try one. Okay. Um, thanks, Sergey. that was really interesting. Uh, I found, but you introduced me to, to a, literature that I should obviously be aware of, but I'm not this this literature on the political consequences of depression um, in political science. Um, I guess my my question it could be completely irrelevant, but I was just wondering if you've thought at all about so you emphasized how um, political oppression can produce depression. Um, but since you're quite historically inclined in this paper, I wonder too if you've thought about the historical literature that suggested that freedom can cause depression. So this is something that's been part of psychiatric literature since at least the 1800s, this idea that people become mentally ill because they have too much freedom. And it's something that resurfaces quite regularly in political literature. And I think we see it still now uh, in more kind of um, polemic writings on the right. Um, so I don't know if that's something you thought about, if that's at all relevant. I'd just be interested in hearing what you think. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, your brilliant uh, question. Um, I would like to uh, return to one of uh, my slides, uh, if it's possible, physically or mentally. Uh, we can recall it. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, speaking about uh, psychiatry and uh, medical imperialism in uh, Austro-Hungarian, uh, uh, Austria and uh, Germany between us. Uh, 
uh, first and second world wars. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, yeah, you can see it. Uh, so uh, these guys, uh, some of them was from far right, some of them was from right, uh, uh, from, from the right. They spoke that, of course, something kind of liberalization that came in the uh, 20s in Weimar Republic in Germany, it is the main cause. Uh, um, main reason, the main reason of depression, because people become depressed because they don't know what to do in this um, rapidly changing society, rapidly changing world. And then uh, what uh, they proclaimed, they, okay, here come we, uh, experts in psychiatry, experts in human mind, we will make some uh, experiments like physiological, even physiological experiments, because there was uh, a constitution of, uh, like a physiological constitution of a good leader with a, a good hormonal profile uh, who can be leader um, for people who are undergoing these, these changes. So um, that is a very um, significant discourse, a very significant form of politicization of uh, depression among far rights. And it is um, probably even more old than we uh, all can imagine. Some of these people, they used Virchow's, um, Rudolf Virchow's uh, ideas of social medicine. Well, Virchow was not a right, uh, far right uh, politician. He was a politician, but he was kind of liberal um, politician speaking about uh, uh, making uh, the life of the poor people more, more healthy and uh, so on. Uh, he took part in the revolution of uh, 80. Uh, 48, and uh, of course, uh, he was not prone to uh, make any points about uh, the form of racial hygiene uh, that uh, was proclaimed by uh, these guys. Of course, uh, I think now far right discourse is also about this. Uh, we, uh, of course, neoliberalism also can be oppressive. The formal uh, freedom without a natural freedom is also uh, really oppressive. And we are speaking about this uh, when we see the inequalities um, correlation with uh, depression and and uh, so on. So um, uh, here I'm far from rejecting uh, that uh, neoliberalism can also cause depression can be um, some kind of uh, uh, machine producing the depression. But I think, and my point is, uh, that oppressive regimes, uh, not only capitalist regimes, but uh, political oppressive regimes, benefit from citizens' depression more than neoliberal societies. Because for neoliberal societies, it is uh, some kind of oppression of uh, um, a free market relationship, like uh, concurrent uh, relationships and so on. That is why they are trying to uh, give uh, people some medicine or undergo some kind of psychotherapy for uh, get rid of uh, symptoms of uh, depression. So I hope I've uh, addressed uh, your, uh, I've answered uh, your question. Uh, thank you for asking me. Yes, 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 and can we see uh, probably Dan? Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan, for your question. Do we have any other questions? You're in the room. Or online. <laughs> if not, I I will ask a, something that is like more broader question. Um, uh, first of all, thank you for this very interesting, very whimsical and satirical, <laughs> very full cool humor uh, presentation. Um, 
Great, but how, I wanted to ask about a more uh, of a broader perspective. You you talked about the phenomenological lived experience of depression and oppressive. There is a kind of a connection, even uh, terminological here, being oppressed or being depressed. Is it the same? Um, but yes, we have this um, phenomenological perspective on this. This is like traditional phenomenological perspective. You cite Radcliffe and goes to the Husserlian tradition. Uh, but is it also the, uh, if something that reminds me uh, or brings uh, very quickly this kind of idea of um, anti-psychiatry or critical phenomenological perspective on these matters? Um, it, it's something that comes first to mind when you talk about politics and psychiatry or the politicization of psychiatry of what is mental illness or mental disorder. So what do you think about generally about this kind of perspective of anti-psychiatry in the traditional sense? Because this is what they wrote about, how uh, we could uh, understand mental illness if there is such a thing, if not, if it's not a myth or something like that, um, from a more broader social political perspective. So, how would you how would you just view it from that perspective? Do you think that that perspective, uh, something that is now called critical phenomenology or in a more broader sense or traditional sense is uh, anti psychiatry or something anti-psychiatric that could be critical of the way that um, the state influences the way the psychiatrists will view what a mental disorder is and in the sense uh, who are the people who are to be treated in a certain way or discarded or uh, put away as disordered in some way. So do you think that that perspective is somehow helpful for this issue, for understanding of this? Or would you just um, think that the more traditional phenomenological approach is... Because I'm not suggesting that you should embrace any of this kind of uh, issues, uh, perspectives, but your perspective was more on the subjective experience, the lived experience of people under oppressed regimes in oppressive reg regimes and their kind of depression. But do you think that also this kind of perspective would be useful philosophically to understand or to criticize these issues? Thanks. Uh, thank you for this very basic, very uh, significant uh, question. So, uh, of course, I'm far from denying uh, the contribution of critical uh, philosophy, critical phenomenology towards uh, this discussion. Of course, uh, Svetkovich and uh, the tradition um, that uh, she also belongs to some kind of critical uh, phenomenology, critical uh, thinking. It is very significant, and uh, um, I'm just starting. It was a basic. It was a starting point for me to uh, speculate about this, to theorize uh, about uh, the, these kind of things. Uh, however. Uh, I think that uh, my focus is a bit different because uh, people from uh, critical uh, phenomenology, mainly speaking about neoliberalism, contemporary capitalism, I'm also uh, ready to uh, discuss these topics. This is really important. Uh, however, there are still there are societies where uh, some basic human rights are violated. Not in all neoliberal countries, uh, human rights are violated. And uh, of course, there are different types of silence in, in these societies and different type of experience, of political experience. And uh, while we are thinking about uh, um, some kind of modeling the political reactions and so on, we should uh, pay attention to what the experience of person under political uh, oppression and 
politically depressed people. And I think uh, it is the first uh, distinguishing feature. And the second distinguishing feature is that uh, I'm trying also to uh, take into account the clinical depression. Uh, and the healthcare means to overcome uh, some kind of the, the most uh, significant symptoms of clinical depression. Uh, and I am happy uh, that uh, in nine days, uh, Vojn Rakic will uh, speak about um, uh, moral enhancement uh, that, uh, um, yes, or simplifying provoke more empathy. And I, I think that could be, uh, of course, not the uh, main, but the one uh, instrument towards the change in the perspective of such kind of people who underwent the political oppression. Because, of course, they're not morally vicious, but uh, their empathy is disrupted, corrupted by, uh, by the oppressive uh, regime. So that is why I'm uh, trying to emphasize this kind of dimension. It's not about, uh, okay, I'm of course really fond of uh, Coldian thought about uh, psychiatry, but here when we are speaking about uh, the healthcare policy, maybe the policy of uh, doing something in, in the terms of uh, medical intervention, it is also a possibility to change uh, the perspective, and especially it is actual for contemporary Europe because people in last, I guess, uh, five, uh, seven years, people from uh, different uh, neighboring to Europe, uh, oppressive countries, they flee to Europe and they have specific experience of depression. It is not uh, the depression that is uh, comparable to the depression uh, in neoliberal society. So mm, I guess healthcare professionals should argue to what these cases in a uh, slightly different form. And uh, that is why I'm trying to emphasize their phenomenological experience. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, okay, thank, thank you for the answer. It's very, uh, very specific uh, and really answer this worry I had or this question I had. So you're just you're using phenomenology to analyze and show that maybe even this is kind of a, a distinct uh, psychopathological ent entity or category of depression. It, it is kind of different depression that uh, comes about when someone is living in an oppressive state. Uh, I think it's also very important that you are uh stressing this kind of ecological the, the factors the the environmental factors in this case of course these are not just material but so, sociological socio material factors the, the the delivered world that the person is being thrown in and that it influences the mental state of the individual and so on and back and forth of course there's this kind of relation between the environment the society and the individual and I will totally support this kind of view of understanding how psychopathology is to be understood something that is not just individual but goes more collectively to understand it in relation with the environment so thank you for pointing out all these very important issues in your in your presentation uh, we have another question here in the chat I'll just read it so uh, first, Sai Mila is uh, thanking the speaker for the amazing presentation, and she's a student majoring in psychology and philosophy cluster. So she wanted to ask something that a friend had asked her um, recently. Why phenomenology? Why do you think it is important to combine it with the psychology? And how could mental health professionals benefit from this intersecting of two fields? So if you could. And uh, this, I uh, think it goes just in line with what you already said answering my question. Uh, okay, um, uh, you you just uh, addressed the second one. Yes, question. Yeah. 
uh, second question. Oh, okay. Uh, is there a first question? So in the first part, she says, I'm interested in studying suicide through a psychophenomenological perspective, and such it is fascinating to see how the two fields can be combined to study mental health as influenced by politics. So you can address that also. If you uh, okay, I will uh, address first uh, as a second one, and then uh, probably mention so, uh, something about uh, the um, uh, suicide. Uh, I think that it is uh, significant for uh, healthcare professionals to understand, uh, firstly and basically, uh, the, the experience, of course, of, of this person, but uh, the, the form of relatedness of them towards their family, their closest friends, and so on, because uh, in contemporary biotics, we see that the concept of relational autonomy becomes more common than the concept of individual autonomy, like a kind of neoliberal conception of autonomy, uh, very old and uh, uh, very strict. Uh, but uh, this uh, form of uh, delving into the problem, it gives us some information, some intuitions uh, maybe about how it looks like the relatedness of people who underwent, have uh, undergone uh, their uh, political oppression, how they are related to uh, their family, to their homeland, hometown, probably they are not living now in uh, their homeland, but they have relatives living in their homeland and so on. And that is why these uh, people can be depressed just because of their emotional empathy and uh, so on. And that is why it is kind of significant, uh, significant different way of addressing, addressing their autonomy, thinking about togetherness as a probable vulnerability, not as a uh, support of uh, their decision-making, uh, their psychological state, and so on. So that is why I'm trying to emphasize uh, this topic probably can be interesting for uh, healthcare professionals. And uh, yeah, speaking about uh, suicide, I didn't touch the suicide rates uh, here, but, but of course they are uh, linked uh, with the prevalence of uh, uh, depression among the uh, non-dominant groups. And uh, of course, um, uh, uh, okay, I, I had uh, some kind of thought experiment about uh, suicide and demography in uh, uh, oppressive regime. Uh, so probably I'm not going to share this right now with you, but if you are interested, please, I, I don't know, just uh, uh, I didn't uh, give you a contact detail, but Probably I can, uh, or, uh, you, you can write it uh, in the chat. You, you have my, yes, please write my email and I will uh, share uh, with you my thoughts about this. And um, it is also a bit, um, a bit strange and uh, a bit funny, just uh, not because uh, political oppression is funny, but uh, when you're uh, addressing these kind of topics, and uh, uh, you have uh, something, something kind of uh, emotional uh, uh, delving into this. Uh, you are emotionally linked with the problem. It's better to have some some kind of irony um, in order to be a good uh, researcher, still a good researcher, despite of your emotions and uh, your feelings. Yeah, thank you for your questions. Okay, thank you, Sergey. Uh, do we have any more questions? Okay, we have. Uh, thank you for the answer and the contact I'll leave from our listener on Zoom. 
Well, we do not have any more questions or comments. I think this uh, time, uh, at least here, time is going uh, towards the lunch time. So uh, I guess uh, uh, if, if I guess it, it would be an inhuman to make it uh, a really long, long event, uh, just communicating a lot of depression and uh, depression in order to have a good appetite during, uh, during your lunch. So. Okay, um, so we will not oppress any more philosophers and psychiatrists here by, by our lecture, so we would like Thank uh, Sergei Shevchenko again for his wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hopefully he will come again and give another lecture here at our seminar. So thanks everyone who were here uh, with us uh, at the Institute and for, uh, from people online. Okay, uh, and see you hopefully again in about a week. Our next lecture is on the November 22nd. And when I think we'll be talking about moral enhancement in humans, so a topic that comes very close to what you were talking about. Thanks again for listening. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your brilliant questions. And goodbye. <laughs>